Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with the Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 66. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, today's guest is Fiona Z. Lohan, and um, she'll be joining us in just a minute. Before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995, and we are unaffiliated with any other organization. Um, and if you like poetry as much as we do, please click the like button and share and do all that good fun stuff because that helps um, these videos spread around the internet. Now, I know we're streaming well on YouTube and Periscope, but Facebook seems to be having a problem. Is anybody... I'm going to have to refresh this page. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Let me try this. I want to make sure we get to the Facebook people because that's where our uh, biggest audience is. Let's see. Okay, so I think it was just a mistake on the on the very end end. So we're good. I think we're flowing Facebook. But if every, anybody could leave a comment on Facebook, I would appreciate it to make sure it's working there. Um, but it's definitely work on YouTube and up on Periscope and, and uh, Twitter. So we're all good. We're good to go. Thanks, everybody, for joining me once again. Um, as always, we like to start with a intro poem uh, from some different poet. And um, I clicked the random button on the website and came up with Kathleen Wakefield, who is actually... Um, a pretty interesting story for me. This is her poem that we're going to be reading in a second. The Invisible Stenographer Rediscovers the Wheel. But so Kathleen Wakefield um, is from my hometown in Rochester, New York. And she actually, I had no idea, um, but she came to my class in fifth grade, I think it was, and taught us a poetry workshop. And she was my first poetry teacher in fifth grade. Um, I remember her coming with a little cart and uh, sharing. I think we read um, maybe some Frost poems and then wrote something about the snow. It's a snowy area of the world and then uh, we published her and then a few years after that my mother realized that they were childhood friends and um, I had no idea so Kathleen Wakefield is sort of all over the place in my uh, life story in a weird way and she has a few books out her um, one of her projects she's done is this invisible stenographer and the, and she has a whole series of poems about the invisible stenographer and this is one of, I think we published three all in one issue and they're in a book. I'm not sure which book that is, but um, this is The Invisible Stenographer Rediscovers the Wheel. Seems like only yesterday, the log roller, then the potter's wheel and Sumerian chariot, the fixed axle and spoke, tires, leather and metal, not until 1888 Dunlap's pneumatic tire. And don't forget the water wheel, pulley, windlass and clock, all the possibilities and problems of continuous motion. Is it boredom? or the cloudless blue sky that sends her five stories down from the rooms where she writes these days to the three-speed red bicycle someone's left to rust in, an, in the alley. She hops on, expecting to tip like a child, but it's as if she's always known how the pedal's resistance melts into a spinning fever floating between two walls of air. She wonders how fine a line she could trace between what's true and false, the self and the other, the yin and yang of it all. Why this point she's balancing on could be the present turning into the past, all the possible lines of the future fanning out before her. She imagines riding no hands, doing a wheelie, lifting herself out of time and space. She hums, pedals and spokes spinning, prayer wheel, mandala, untouchable, unnameable nothing, she sings faster and faster until, breathless, legs aching, she thinks she may be human after all. Red streamers shoot like flames from her wrists. Seen from a distance, she's nothing more than a blur on the horizon furiously scribbling itself across the face of the earth. And that was The Invisible Stenographer Discovers the Wheel by Kathleen A. Wakefield. Um, her most recent book, I just looked this up, it came out um, a few years ago, is Give or Grip, Give and Sway. So you can check that out. Uh, Kathleen Wakefield, once again, Grip Given Sway is her most recent book, so look that up. This is her Goodreads page, and look at that five-star rating. Um, she's a wonderful poet, and um, thanks to her I, uh, for introducing me to poetry very early on, um, even though I didn't realize it was her. Um, now, today's guest um, is Fiona Z. Lohan, and um, we are going to, let me see here, I have to pop up her... Uh, Note. We have a lot of uh, work to go over, which is really cool. But Fiona C. Lohan is a poet, translator, and editor. 
and Zheng Harpist, who writes and translates in English, French, Chinese, and occasionally Spanish. She's the author of four books of poetry now. The most recent one is right here, which just came out hot off the press. Um, this is Rain in Plural um, from, I think it's Princeton University Press. Yeah, Princeton University Press. You can find it at press.princeton.edu. And um, she's over in Paris, France right now. And um, that's why we're doing the show a little earlier than we normally do. Um, and here she is. Um, Fiona Z. Lohan, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, first of all, how were things? And you mentioned um, earlier that everything is locked down and, and you sort of, you know, stuck for the coronavirus. Um, how are things doing in the in the city now? Well, the city is rather, I should say, rather quiet. Um, there's a second lockdown, so we are all each um, supposed to stay at home. We can go out for, say, an hour to do um, the essentials, but basically that's that. And we need permission, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we need to provide the paperwork to prove that we, we have legitimate reasons to be outside. Oh, wow. Yes, and otherwise, you know, we are being fined. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I think it's 135 euros for the first time, and then after that, it goes up to a thousand something. Oh, wow. That's very different than, than here. I mean, you know, it's encouraged to, to wear masks and stuff, but that's about it. Um, yeah, yes. what about like exercise? Do, do you, are people allowed to, um, you know, walk and, and just get, you know, because vitamin D is so important with this, this virus too in the body's um, immune system. Is, are you allowed to go and get sun or is everybody sort of hunkered down in their, in their living spaces? Well, you're allowed to get sunshine as long as within that one hour. One that hour. Applies to exercise. Wow, wow. That's, that's, yeah, well, oops, I forgot to turn off the uh, space here. here we go. Um, well, why don't you start us out with a poem? Um, I don't know what we'd like to start with. Um, I'm going to read the first poem mm -hmm. from Rain in Puro. Um, more vulnerable than others. So what if I break? I will continue to eat mud, unwind underground mask, band signs, chew holes in every tall grip vine, breed my roots after a nap, spread fronds as free clothes, free money. Lay branches bare with the moon and its jaws, while each flower falls to its own bad dream. Yeah, beautiful poem, and, and very um, typical of your style, which is very, I, I feel like it's very painting oriented. Maybe we'll um, talk about that later, but it feels like every line is sort of a brush stroke, adding something to um, sort of the palette that's going on. That's the impression I get when I read. Uh, your books and, and your work. Um, but but first of all, I want to talk a little bit about your just your background and how much, you know, you were born in Singapore, you've been all over the world in New York, um, you ended up in Paris. Um, in addition to being a poet, you're also a professional harpist. Um, so so what, what is your journey like to, to be to this point where you're, you're publishing poetry books? Um, can you just give a little bit of your, of your background? Uh, yes, I was born in Singapore. And um, I went to New York for my studies. Um, I do have a second home in, in the United States in the sense that um, um, I go back um, frequently, um, mostly for work reasons. And um, I do have close friends there in America. But beyond that, I, I do recognize myself more as a European. Um, given my sensibilities, uh, I mean, I don't use the word awesome <laughs> as, much as, I, as much as I would love to. Um, and um, uh, in terms of my Asian heritage, uh, I wish, I mean, I wish I have someone to talk to in Chinese as frequently as I would like, but um, that's not the case. Um, I translate um, from the Chinese to English and sometimes occasionally, I mean occasionally, um, French. I do all ways of translation except from something into Chinese. Mm -hmm. So that's the one traffic that I don't um, circulate. Why, why is that? I don't think I enjoy, um, I think enjoy is not the right word. I don't think I love Chinese language. Mm -hmm. um, 
in terms of its ideology. I, I think I love the language in terms of its culture, its style, its aesthetics. But most of the time when we, I hear um, people speaking Chinese, um, it's done in some sort of that's that's not necessarily not necessarily the Mandarin I would like to recognize with or I would love to associate with. Um, say, for instance, you know, when someone wants to exit or make uh, wants to leave the room, you know, you don't need to say we make a departure or make an exit from that, you know, sort of stuff. Um, so, yes, I, I I go for the more plain spoken, as plain as possible, as natural as possible, and I don't really think that um, it's easy to find that sort of Chinese distilled to its bare. Um, in the media, in the books I read, oh. etc., and that filters into conversations now, daily conversations. You have to listen to what has been hidden, what's not been spoken, um, and I sense that in the English language too. Strangely, in these um, recent five, six years, it could be related to the political climate. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. You know, I was, I've always wondered what I don't know much about contemporary Chinese poets. Um, what what is the state of um, poetry in China like are there are there poet like how are poems published are there books of poetry are there magazines are they published in newspapers like we used to here what what's the sort of status of poetry in China I would say that poetry can be a way of life in China mm -hmm. uh, or any other um, not too capitalist cultures um, in terms of publishing, that's a different thing, you know. Um, now, nowadays, I think even poets in China are concerned about uh, royalties and money and that sort of stuff, and they start to adopt the same sort of an American mentality when it comes to publishing, mm -hmm. which is really too bad. Um, I would say that, on the other hand, in France, it's much more interesting when it comes to the grassroots, uh, small presses, um, letter press printing there's still very much of a tradition mm -hmm. and a spirit is that um, earlier you mentioned that you sort of have a um, a European um, spirit or something like that I can't remember the word you use but is that what the kind of thing you were talking about like what is it about Europe that that makes you feel most at home um, well I feel at home in, in Paris mm -hmm. um, where, where I live um, I wish I could feel more at home you know in places like New York um, I mean, I feel at home with with, with Americans, um, but I would say that I enjoy uh, America much less than, than Americans. I think Americans are always much more interesting than America. <laughs> um, New York is a huge city, you see. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't need anyone. It doesn't need me. Um, but I, I think to some extent Paris does need me or, or, or someone. Mm -hmm. I, I think I look for the soul in a place. Um, and it's hard when... With money is always, you know, in the air. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. As I shan't say that Paris is not that, you know, not that because there is that here too, or in any city nowadays. But I would say that there's more, there's more resistance, and it could be staged up. It could be staged much more um, easily, given the fact that France is a smaller country and. and and the United States isn't very much diverse now in terms of, um, in terms of even opinions. Mm -hmm. It's divided. So, um, yes. But uh, you have to understand that um, I'm not someone who quite believes in the graphical center. Um, I think a spiritual center is much more interesting. I don't even believe in a linguistic center, mm -hmm. you see, in, in part because I don't have a principal language. So I don't need, I, I, I can't. I wish I had one sometimes, um, with a center, you know, to look out. But uh, once I have that, I realize that it keep it keeps moving. So I have to find a way to deal with that. You know, instead of making it a disadvantage, I have to know how to live with it. So I make it into some sort of mobility, and I have to juggle with whatever contradictions it gives me and it springs back to me. Um, it's a it's a daily struggle. It's, it doesn't seem that fantastic as a virtue. Mm. Um, what do you, uh, you know, I was just reading recently about how there's certain percentage of the population that does, doesn't have a voice in their head. Um, do, and do you have a voice, like a running narrative in your head, like a dialogue, you know, a voice that's actually speaks in your head? And if so, I'm wondering what language it would speak. Um, like, 
Like what, what language is the voice in your head? I get an equivalent of this question when people ask me what language did I dream? Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's the same question. Yeah, yeah. Is there And my answer is that most of my dreams are silent hmm. and black and white. But the subtitles it depends, you know, on, on the picture. Mm -hmm. So So that's pretty much that's pretty much what um my answer so but, but do you have a voice in your head like do you do you think through um voice. in language because some people are more imagistic and you're very you know artistic um too so it wouldn't be surprising and music and you know music is a central part of your life as well um so i'm just curious like how like what's your what's your thinking like what's your internal monologue um is it in a certain language does it shift between languages or is it sort of imagistic and and like like it is for some people it does shift um, I think a better way of under, of responding to that is that I certainly don't don't control the voice. I let it come to me. So I practice more listening in that sense. Um, so I, I guess I I train myself to have that distance between me and me. Hmm, interesting. Um, could be interpreted uh, interpreted as some sort of a Buddhist um, meditation or, or some sort of, you know it doesn't need to be Buddhist. And I know all my Catholic friends do that too. It's, it's into another zone of a meditation or, or some sort of a non-self, non-thought. Um, it's possible. Um, it allows you to have more self-knowledge, I think. And to ultimately realize that maybe the voice you hear in, in the head might not be yours. Mm. You know, you come from somewhere else and, um, and it's not necessarily reliable. Um, I think the eye could be much more interesting on the other hand. And so when it comes to writing poetry, I do allow the eye to guide me more when it comes to the lines and architecture. Um, and it, to some extent, it is true that now when I write a poem, I'm wondering whether I can make it to, into some sort of a painting, even just with words. Mm. Um, not to the extent of doing like a word play and a visual um, poem, because I do focus on the sense and, and the contents of it. But I think that the eye is interesting to the extent that it can be trained and it can be rational. Um, if only we know that what we're seeing is what is being seen and what's been shown. Hmm. And of course, that's always not possible because whatever we think we know is only what we thought. Um, so that makes some... Um, perception much more interesting I think um, in general it, it shouldn't stay on the surface um, anything that's first seen first glimpsed um, it's, it's good to have some distance hmm. do you think um, I, I love that phrase that, that you try to keep a distance between me and me and I've wondered if poetry um, in a way sort of bridges a gap between me and me and, and sort of puts the me in, in connection with the other me or something but you're, you're do you think you keep that distance with poems um or, or do you... I, I do um i do not necessarily necessarily feel attached to my poems hmm. um i'm consistently doubting how far they can go and i wouldn't mind dismantling one or two sometimes just to see how how much further i can go so not feeling, not feeling that sort of attachment allows me to play um, again with the distance, um, and also with the time, the time space mm -hmm. of the work of, of the poem. Yeah, they do. The, the poems all feel very in, in my head. I, I was sort of imagining a painting being created in front of me with every poem. That's sort of how it feels. Like there's like layers that are sort of being added as you go. And it does feel very detached from time and, and space in an interesting way. It's really cool how that comes across and how that ends up being what you're actually um, trying to do with these poems. Do you want to share maybe two more and then we'll, we can take some questions for the audience too, I should say. So if anybody has any questions for Fiona C. Lohan, um, please leave them in the chat window, either on YouTube or Facebook. I'm monitoring those too. Um, but, but yeah, why don't you read some poems? I'm going to read two short ones. Okay. Um, also from Rain and Pluro, which, by the way, um, is a title that sort of associates itself with this distance from between me to me, because it, 
it introduces the idea of a collective. Mm -hmm. you see. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let me know what page so, so I can show it. Oh, yes, it's page seven. Okay. Thank you. It, the problem with music. I broke my gooding string by string, wheels in astral mode, down a spongy hill, or God knows what splendid historic clean. Snow did not come to mind when my feet expected it. Suddenly clean, the idea of acting versus its ideology. I watched the aria with a deep breath from a source of torture. I did nothing, telling myself I must do nothing. That was the problem with music from Rain in Plural. Um, why don't you read another one? Yes, of course. And then we'll read a very short one. Reincarnated, but not for the first time. This happens when I'm ready for my own flesh. If only the world were as spacious and precise as such a moment, I wouldn't need outlaws and my goddamned pride. I would be able to fix the smooth decline. Interesting. That was reincarnated, but not for the first time. Um, you mentioned music in the first poem, um, and yeah. and you're a harpist. Um, and what can you explain what a little what zang is? Um, I, I don't. I haven't actually. I'm not familiar with it at all. What is what is zang harp? Well, the guzheng is um, a long harp, mm -hmm. um, twenty one to twenty three strings with movable bridges, mm -hmm. and it plays is supposed to be played horizontal. Um, so that's very much it. Um, I mean, it's, it's the mo modern version of um, Guzheng. And there's another um, ancient, I shouldn't say version, but the ancient um, other, which is called the Qing, uh, the Qing. And that's a much more um, simplified hate the word simplified because it's not true it's actually much more difficult it doesn't have bridges and it's just strings and you can sit playing on you know sit and play with it on your laps etc um, i don't know how to play um, the, the, the scene uh, I, I wish i could um, when it comes to the gooding it's much more um, tonality driven mm. so they're melodies and it's harder to play abstract compositions on it without modulating and shifting the key uh, is physical so when you, when you play it uh, i liken it to more like more of a sport and when i do it mm. the intellectual exercise is behind the head you can do all the intellectual style when you practice but when you play the piece you know you're in it um, yeah that, that's really interesting how how does um you know your music relate to poetry is there something um what, is there is there something they have in common, or are they like different? Like you mentioned, you, you just said that the music is like your it's like a sport. Do you think um, um, is there what do they have? What do they have connected? Why do you do both? I think it might be hard sometimes for um, most people to to see that it's possible to do different things um, at one time. At different intensities, um, but it's possible. It, it, it has to do with the society needing to pigeonhole um, by profession, um, etc. Um, but that's not true. I, I'm not interested in being a musician, being a poet, being a translator. I'm interested in constructing my world, this world, you know, where different, where, where these different ways of imagination and maps define this world. So you can go into this room and you see this, you go into that room and you see this, but this whole world is comes from this source and, and, and that's whoever we, we, we did that. So the same thing with translation, you know, I, I do get the question of how different is translation from writing, etc. Um, it's hard to answer that question because obviously there are differences, but I've never found that um, um, gripping um, on a personal level. They are, they are nice, they're productive um, when 
you are engaged in a practice and you want to improve yourself and you know, technically or whatnot. But when it comes to the unknown, unknownable ability, the mystery of certain things, you need that. You, know, you need to get into the soul of it. That sort of question sort of disappear you know, because they're they're mainly about boundaries. You know how and it's asking about how do we, what are we going to do with the boundaries between um, the music and between uh, the music and the poetry or between this and that. When precisely what I'm trying to do is to get rid of the boundaries. Mm. You see, um, and music is another form of poetry making for me, and poetry is another form of music making for me vice versa, and sometimes they don't come together at all, sometimes they fight, but it doesn't really matter, you see, they're all part of that one world. Um, well, do you want to read a few more poems? Yes. Um, i read one, Far From Description. At what page? Uh, that's on page 21. Okay. Day after day, this sentence grew longer. The verb ran faster than expected. Pushy as ever, it hurt the feelings of its own speaker. I was the speaker who couldn't agree with its mood. It wasn't grief, ecstasy, or fury I experienced when pregnant with the verb. It was the way a regret lingered, stuck and turning in one corner, as if it couldn't perish without being heard, as if its madness drove me to silence, as a reason of the sound of it mattered. Yeah, just beautiful lines throughout all of your work. So, um, so I don't know, there's so much airiness to it, too. Um, we have a couple questions here. Um, first of all, Emma Lynn... Um, Emlyn Willard Hughes asks if you compose music. Do you do you compose music too? I'm starting to, mm -hmm. and I thought it was hard. Yeah, because without words, the sound in itself needs to sustain themselves, not just on a melody. I'm not certain I would succeed at it, but I'm trying. And you know, if I can't, I would just give it up. Um, I would say that, you know, all my love has been trained as an instrumentalist. So it's hard to all of a sudden um, not think about that, about the instrument, but just from a piece of blank paper, blank manuscript paper, and look at the five lines um, right from the scratch. So that's a challenge. Yeah, I, I, I always think of music as, as very similar. Like, like the way, you know, themes repeat in sort of, drift and like the sound is the same as the way sound shapes and like near rhymes and things work in poetry um do you do you think you write poems by ear like are you listening to the music of the words as you go um or are you how, how do you how do you go about writing a poem like like the one you just read um how does it come to you and then how do you move through it and, and process it and put it on the page first it came to me by luck mm -hmm. and then i have to do something about the luck you know, and, and to transform the luck into some sort of magic. And that's where the music making happens. Um, and that music making is mostly physical for me. That's to say that I read aloud my poems before I really commit to writing it out. Um, I write longhand. Um, I don't type my poems, um, not these days anymore, until I feel committed, really, to the poem. I think it was one of my friends, Mark Strand, who said the same thing too, that when you type out a poem, it became so permanent and beautiful and, and somehow visually um, deceiving that you thought you have it. You know? mm -hmm. But most of the time it's not true. So my way of handling that is that I will read it aloud and to my, to my uh, shock, um, most of the time, even when I thought that I had it, I just couldn't read it the way I thought I want to hear it. Mm -hmm. You see, um, nowadays sometimes I cheat by asking, you know, my more experienced friends, especially my active friends, to read it back to me, you know, as some sort of a trial, and then I hear it, mm -hmm. and and I can let that go much more easily because there's the fixation on on voice too, if you like, 
you know, for a musician to hear certain things that you thought you want to be heard. Um, but that's that's not always um, reliable or, or, or durable or meaningful. Yeah. Um, it, could, it could easily turn into something, you know, fantastic. Um, and, and for five minutes you thought it, it sounds wonderful, but, you know, after five years you, you go back to it and, and it's a disaster. Yeah, yeah, we... Um... It, it rattle when we're choosing poems to publish we read them out loud too um in our editorial meetings because you really you have to sort of hear the the music in the air or something and then notice your body's reaction to it i guess is probably how it works um liz winfield over on uh, youtube asks how does poetry help construct your world how important is science silence solitude and voice and the voices of other poets in this process so how does poetry construct your world how important is silence and... how important is silence solitude and the voices of other poets in the process for you silence solitude and the voices of other poets uh -huh. um silence is very important i think um this is a reader who, who has caught something in in my poems in that I'm writing between silence and silence. And the same way when it comes to translation, that uh, people often ask me about translation-specific problems or, or questions, which I avoid um, most of the time, not because I'm evasive, but simply because um, when it comes to translation, I, I do things from silence to silence. I don't deal with the language, you see. I'm interested in the quality of the silence in each mapping of the imagination. So when you are into that, the words are on the side, you know, it's, I, I think it's, um, it's tempting to come up with intellectual discourse, you know, to justify choices of translation and whatnot. But it never seems to be something that I'm good at, or something that I, um, I was looking for. So I, I, I only came to realize that I was in fact looking for different forms of silence and I was translating one form of silence into another. Mm. And I saw then in my work most of the time how to construct silence with words. Um, poetry is very much a center of my world in the sense that it allows you to have one compass to walk in. Um, and I say that's a center because it's, um, it's it's much more generous than, say, prose or music or whatnot, because it gives the reader lots of uh, lots of space. You know, the reader can read any way into it um, and interpret it to walk into this world. And within this world, the reader has his or her own world. It's, it's not something um, decisive that you must go into this one world. It's, no, it's, it's it just keeps growing and, and it's sort of generated. It can it can be seen as a garden in a way. Hmm. You see. Um, in terms of solitude, I'm afraid I'm not a um, noisy um, poet um, in a sense that um, I don't encourage um, crowds in my poems, in part because I'm someone who is highly skeptical of collective and uh, collective power, um, not because I don't believe in communities, quite the contrary, because rain and plural is exactly what it is. Um, but I think being collective is not always going in the right direction when it's based on consensual arrangements. For instance, it's hard for people to disagree, but why? You know, and, and there's always disagreements that bring people forward, and, and and criticism is what it should be that drives improvement. Um, in, in in our, I mean, in in the present America, is a la la land. You know, are you happy? Are you pleased with it. It has to do with the Facebook too, not just America, but the whole world, that whether you like this or not. So that's sort of a consensual way of thinking. I don't encourage that much in my poems in a way. Um, for instance, the first poem I read, um, more vulnerable than others, I had a feedback from a very intelligent reader that's negative, you see. Um, uh, I would say it's pessimistic, but it's not negative, you see. So there's a difference between both, that sometimes people can't right away get it. Um, but it's all right, it's not a sin, it's not anything, and, and I usually let it go. Um, I think solitude is important. We need to learn how to be alone. And unfortunately, society or societies don't encourage that. 
And this is one reason why, say, um, the lockdown in France is difficult. People are just resisting it um, because they don't know what to do when they're on their own. You see, at some point you will have to start thinking, what, you know, what am I going to do with myself, you see? Um, and take away technology and stuff like that. Um, it gets harder. I think poetry cultivates that mm -hmm. center. It allows you to come back to yourself. Um, whether it breeds narcissism or not, that's another thing. Um, it, it allows you to cultivate friendships in a very different way. Um, but friendship can be a form of solitude too. Mm -hmm. So that's um, perhaps a more um, general way of responding to um, um, the question. As for the voices by other poets, I, I, I mean, I obviously do have um, favorite poets I, I go back to often, mostly modernist uh, masters. Um, but it's harder now, it gets increasingly hard for me to read and write at the same time. Mm. I'm afraid I read more um, um, than writing. Um, well, I'm afraid it's not a. It's actually good to read more than you write. Um, I would say that when I write, I do try my best not to read, um, just so that I can, you know, stay stay on the page. And um, is he? It's interesting to be able to steal ideas of images, um, but I'm not. But I'm not on at that stage in that sense. You know, I, I see them more more like an exercise. Um, it doesn't stick for long. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting what you talked about. Um, you know how how solitude is important. And yet our society, you know, more and more are just built around always being connected and never having solitude, um, which makes me think that poetry maybe is more important for than ever, uh, because it's one avenue where you can sit quietly in a room and sort of engage in, in sort of meditatively almost on one thing, whether it's writing or reading and that in intimate connection that you have when you're reading. Do you think... Um, um, that that that's poetry sort of place moving forward. Do you think there? Do you do you sense that there's a um a need for poetry if people just sort of realize what they need? Um, um do do you think it's sort of going to be expanding as far as readership, or do you think um we're sort of um you know at, at the edges of um the end of it as we all merge with the the machine or whatever's go whatever's going on? Um. I think there's always a need for poetry, but I don't know whether people need it. Mm. Um, and I don't, I'm not certain that people want poetry. Yeah, I feel like, I th feel like poetry is actually frightening to people. Um, a lot of people yeah. um, in a way, in, in both that you're sort of stuck with your own solitude, as you mentioned before, um, which is sort of like, like have, if, if you look at a waiting room, like I was just um, in, a, in a waiting room earlier this morning and, and nobody can sit and just sit and think, you know, everybody has their phone. And um, so, so that like that sort of loneliness or isolation ends up being terrifying for people in a way. And then also poetry's way that it sort of expands your boundaries and, um, you know, of, of your imagination is what it really does. And I think I think some people don't like the experience of having um their, their boundaries pushed in the way that poetry does by inhabiting some other voice and creating images. Um, do, you, do, you, do you think that that's the case? Do you think that there's something sort of different about people who appreciate and do poetry? Um, or do you think it's sort of something that everybody, if they only knew what they were missing, would enjoy? I agree with you. Um, that's something scary, it seems, about poetry. Um, first of all, it it doesn't recognize any social order, you see. Um, we're just going in the opposite di current or direction against the professionalism of poetry in a way and um, much more advanced societies now. Um, now, it, I'm, I'm consistently asking myself the question, I mean, am I the poet, really, you see? It doesn't mean that you have four books out or five books out, that therefore you're a poet. I mean, you know, what defines you a poet, really? I, and I... I thought I had to answer when I told myself that probably is living, being true to yourself, um, living a lifestyle that's real, 
um, and true to your values and and, and, um, and having some grip um, on reality um, is, is what poetry really is, which is ironical because people always think that poetry is, you know, some fluffy, mm -hmm. um, imaginary thing, you know, airy that floats, but it's not true. Um, and that leads me to certain problems I, I would encounter when it comes to lyrical poetry. I mean, it's beautiful, and I ask myself, other than it, you know, being published, you know, what, what can it do in society? And I ask the same question of myself all the time. Um, you know, what is at stake and how far can it go? I suppose, you know, had I not done poetry, you know, what, what, would, I, what I would be interested in would be mostly activism um, and human rights and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't realize that, you see, um, years ago. Um, I, I did poetry and I'm still doing poetry primarily because I believe in beauty. And, and the aesthetics of it. And I think that's something that we can't lose faith in, that we all want some sort of beauty in our lives. I mean, imagine if we live, you know, um, we live a life like robots, you know, like machines, like, I shan't say robots, but because they do exist and they can be very adorable. Um, but like machines, like computers, you know, where you, where you can't see the other end of it, you know, where people are invisible. I think that would be very sad. There's no humanity, no no beauty, and um, beauty has to do with something that's imperfect, uh, which is perhaps very Asian too, you know, with the Japanese wabi-sabi. Um, it doesn't need to be neat, it doesn't need to be perfect, it doesn't need to deliver something. Um, it's just staying in that present moment and, and see what's next. Uh, and, and that's hard, I think, and that's what poetry is, staying in just that moment. And just reading it, going back to something that's timeless, that doesn't have a time-specific space. Um, I, I don't know why um, it's harder now to uh, hang on to poetry. There can be a variety of reasons, but certainly technology is one of them that is competing for people's attention. And it promises this aspect of efficiency that poetry might not. Because, you know, what results does, does poetry deliver? Nothing. But yet it makes a difference. It, it can change your life. That's what, I, you know, that's the point. But whether you want your life changed or not, I don't know. You see? Yeah, yeah, that's the issue. I think it, it changes your, your consciousness. When, you know, a successful poem, I think the artist finds a way to change their consciousness and then transfer that through the poem to the person who's reading it. And um, that's something that, that it's kind of, it's frightening to people, I think. And... Um, and also so difficult, it is difficult to compete with technology too. Like you get sort of a, you know, a dopamine hit from reading a good poem, right? And um, that, that sense of um, Dickinson with her head, the top of her head being taken off. There's a sort of flood of neurotransmitters. You get goosebumps sometimes. Um, reading submissions, um, we f I, you know, I feel like I'm, you're just like an antenna and you're sort of waiting for a signal and you get a signal and you feel it and you just, your body knows it. Um, but, but compare that to the constant sort of dopamine, like a slot machine thing that's going on with social media. Um, it, it's really tough for that, to, for, for poetry to compete with that. But I feel like we're battling for the soul of humanity or something, even though no one realizes it. Um, well, and, and so anyway, let, let's read some more poems. I think we've been we're, great insights, um, in your conversation. It's really, really fascinating stuff, but, uh, but let's hear a little more poetry too. I'm going to read one poem from Raymond Pluro okay. um, before reading something perhaps from The Ruined Elegance. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is the, the last poem in Raymond Pluro, Eternity. How does one define spirit without blood to make the body known across a shore so point blank that we see its passing tail, ones of stone, before a winter moon, the spirit moves from one width to the next height, lighter than the sweet failure of wind and hours and a stranded sail. Spirit, I don't tell myself we control our field, the random phase of a god who leaves us old, an alley to somewhere hypnotic, prolonged and curved at each turn. When you come, you ask the same question I commit to poor speed. How places grieve poised in distance. 
while the rest of us die trying to live. When you leave, you offer nothing but the reason to fade that is beyond you to respond to silence after the cold when pain outwears pain in quantum physics. I don't tell a soul. What you intuit on a peak. I won't tell others how storm heal or stop the countdown, why echoes blink to preserve the drift. I won't paint your dream in this portrait. And that was the final poem, Eternity, from Fiona's newest book, Rain in Plural, which you can find from University of Princeton Press. Um, let's do, we have a whole bunch of um, other material that you sent too. There's translations um, and there's art as well. Um, let, let's let's share some more of that with the audience. Um, I'm going to read one or two poems. From a book um, called Karma, and it's a book of poems by a contemporary Chinese poet called Yun Li Chuan, um, who was born in 1973. Um, she's interesting in the sense that she does many other things too. Um, she writes fiction, she is a film director, and she writes scripts. Um, and a very active blogger. I think she shut down her blog um, quite some years ago, but she's very active on the internet. And she was one of the first um, few writers or poets who published very actively on the internet um, during the early 2000s. So um, I thought her poems, are, first of all, her poems are very, very different from mine. Um, they're audacious. Um, there are a lot of poems about sex, which is something I would love to write about, but I wish, I don't think I could ever do any better than her. Um, and um, she belonged to this group of poets called the Lower Body Poets. So that gives you some idea what sort of stuff it is. And um, it would be interesting, it would be, uh, I think, too generalizing to say that, you know, they were trying to. Um, um, just protest and um, in, in the young anger um, to say no to everything that's traditional. It's not really that, it's something else. Um, so I'm going to read this poem called This Must Have Been Arranged. Maybe you have it on. Um, yeah, I found it. Okay. So I'm going to read the um, English, my translation. After our separation, Saddam Hussein suddenly disappeared. SARS took the chance to appear. Nurses were braver than sisters. My stomach still hurt. Your leg frostbitten at Mount Everest. Mount Everest was once was again scaled. They said, this is great. After our separation, we never hugged each other. A youth was hastily beaten to death. Murderers were younger than you. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And what was the name of the poet again? Um, Yin Li Chuan. And, um, it's in the book called Karma, and it's published by Towson Books um, just earlier this year. Oh, okay, great. I thought her poems are very clean and you know, short and efficient, and I like that. No blah blah, no, no um, very natural too. Mm -hmm. This is like a voice talking to you right away over the phone. You know, I could, I, at some point I was even asking myself maybe I could do like a phone poem project or something. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I love the the way the poem turns and moves. That you know, through the details, you know, from far away space into closer with the we never hugged each other. Um, Effort, but see, that's also yeah. a choice of translation. Perhaps, you know, if someone else translates the poem, it could be different. Mm -hmm. But I chose this approach, you know, to go into accessible and intimacy. So, um, um, about while we're, while we're um, um, talking about um, Chinese translations, um, Carlton Johnson over on Facebook asked, um, he said, Chinese is a tonal language. So, did that affect the musicality of, well, does that affect? the musicality of the translations, that being a tonal, a tonal language. 
Yes. Um, I try to create an inner music in my translations. Hmm. Now, in the English version, the, the music is inside, it's interior, it's inner. In order to, uh, in order to cure my inability, you know, to reproduce the toner music that we hear when one speaks, um, when one reads the poem in Chinese, because it's simply impossible um, to translate yep. the tone or music, or, or do, do we, because they're just completely two different um, languages. I'm, I'm not sure. So what, yeah, I'm not sure what what he actually meant by tonal language. I don't know. I don't know that much about about Chinese. I guess. What, what does it mean to be a tonal language? I'm, I was trying to imagine I it, but I think perhaps the reader um, was mentioning that you know there might be sound, um, accented words. Um, Oh, we could ask him again. <laughs> yeah. Well, Carlton, if you want to elaborate on that, please, please do. But maybe, do you have any translations where you could read the Chinese and, and then the, the yes. translation in English? Yes, I'm going to read one other poem, and that's from My Mountain Country, if you have the, if you have the um, cover up. It was by another contemporary Chinese poet, and it's a completely different style, completely different voice, of course. Um, and the poet is named Ye Li Ju, um, born 1972, just a year older than Yin Li Chuan. Um, for sure, they, 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 these two poets, I happen to be working on them sort of like back to back in parallel. Um, so I, I sort of chose to do that um, deliberately so that I could stay in that generation, um, chrono you know, the chronological. Um, identification is to some extent important in, in, in terms of understanding the context, so you will, um, the background, and um, less so the biological, uh, biographical um, details, which are important. Um, but there's always something else, I think. Um, so Yin Li Chuan, um, my mountain country, um, she lives in Li Shui, a, in the south of China. Um, on the other hand, um, Yin Li Chuan, the other poet from I've just read, lives in Beijing. So, um, two different um, places. So, the poem, um, By the Water, if you have that. Yeah, let me find it. Um, I'm sure I have it somewhere. Um, just everybody has to bear with me. I'm sorry for the delay. Love story. By the Water, okay. We have it here. Low wild geese brush over our heads. Low dust hooks the white wave. Change is the only constant. By the water, body stripped bare, we shimmer white silver. Rising moonlight, stars as water back to water. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah. Could you... um, I had this thing in, in my head, you know, when I read the translation. I thought in a way that's about translation. Hmm. So uh, that's one reason why I chose it. But um, this also to give you an idea that there are lyrical you know, poets out there um, who write paintings. Mm -hmm. you know? um, could, could you read that in the Chinese too, so we can hear the sounds of it yeah. in the original? Maybe let's see whether there's something called Tona. Yeah. Shuibian 心真是水, I, I love listening to poems in languages that I don't know. Um, they're it's just beautiful to hear, and you know, to to be completely detached from the the meaning and of the words and just hear the sounds is really always always beautiful. Um, well, I'm going to watch more the next time if ever we sell tickets. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. So do you want to, we have, um, you know, maybe like five or 10 minutes left. Do you want to, what do you want to read next? There's still a lot of work that you sent over that we could share. Um, we could 
show the paintings. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and just let me know what, what ones you want to look at. I have... Um, oh, here's the cover from yeah. My Mountain Country. I, I couldn't find it earlier, but this was uh, the book we were just reading from. Um, and that's the name of the poet. Um, Yi Lijin, if, I, if I'm saying that right. My Mountain Country. Um, and so, so let me know um, what you'd like to look at. Uh, we have different pieces here. Oh, you can show all three of them. In, um... Okay. Um, yeah, so this, these are um, yeah, three pieces that, that Fiona sent here. And you're not going to be able to see them on your screen, but um, I'm showing the one right now. Um, what is the type of, of art that this is? Yes, um, they were done in collaboration with Fritz Ottman um, from the Joseph and Arnie Albers Foundation in Bethany, in um, Connecticut. Um, they were done with sumi, sumi e, which is a, sort of a Japanese ink on washi on, on Japanese paper, um, and um, you know I have to find ways to work with. Um, all these different media um, to make make it a poem painting. Uh, obviously, there are a lot in, in Fritz's work that attract me because they are very close to my um, um, my interest in calligraphy and ink and um, you know the, the idea of not you know not black not white and, and you know so what is black and white which is really the yin and yang and the sort of polarity that I never want to address. Um, um, so you know we work around um, different imageries, different play of ink, and um, I have to think of you know what poems to handwrite. Mm -hmm. On the paper, so basically, I have to find a way to communicate to let the words communicate with the images. Do the do the um, images and, come first and then the words, or the other way around? How does that? There was, no, there was no strict formula, as far as I remember. I couldn't. It's funny that now that I start to wonder how the um, stages were. There, there wasn't exactly that. That's what I'm trying to say. There's no, you know. Formula. This, you know, this comes first. That comes first. They all happen almost organically, um, organically in, in, in one whole bubble, you know, in one whole circle. And then when something's happened, you grab it. When something doesn't, you let it go. You see. Um, I think some of the images happened at the same time um, when I thought this can go with that. Um, but obviously, the poems were written. They were from the books. They were written a while back, and I think I wrote a few new poems during the process um, and that was a different way of working um, when you see the image or when when you write a poem before the image and then you do with a new material um, it's yet another layer of mystery hmm. um, different dynamics well do you want to read um read these for people um um, I have to know what poems they are, but they are um, The first one I have here is The Rain um, Came Hard In From the Middle. Do you have something called Au Jardin Sous la Pluie? This was all about rain, like the old masters yeah, I the see. Old, I have that one too, yeah. That's from the Elegant. Okay. And that's the, I believe that was that's the last poem. Le Jardin sous la pluie. And that's a French title and that means garden in the rain or rain garden. I, I, I would translate it as rain gardens. I would get rid of under the rain and sort of thing. Um, All things considered, details render rain free of glory, even more feral than disfigured mountains hoping to be illicit, yet failing in the dry. Pleasure is different when flesh answers to water. The act of receiving a cold try. The way rain sends gladness from sky to my fingers. How do poets speak ill of flowers, make apparent their break of lightness. 
facts be shown in what's wild and bare, glamour replaces the first half of nature. Like the old masters, I seek a shape for rain, a form, a word, something hard to fake. How foolish I am to whitewash thoughts into suitcases of cloud, only to find, may you feel them rise, Monet and Debussy capped rain with discomfort, trying to measure a quiet to pure and transparent for humans. Uh, wow. Yeah, well, one of the great things about um, just poetry readings in general is that it fills your, your mind and imagination with words and images and then makes you want to write poems too. So I hope everybody um, at home who's watching this um, goes and sits down and writes some poetry afterward. Um, we, have, we have time for like one more one more piece. Do you want to finish up with something um, from a book or, yes. or whatever, you, whatever you'd like to finish out with? I would love to end off with a French translation. Um, I'm afraid I didn't send that to you. Um, um, I have it's a short a, a letter from yeah, that's, that's different. It's, it's a little too long. Yeah, um, I translate um, Mark Strand from um, English to French, and I feel you know it's sort of like a ritual to end of my reading sometimes, or to begin my readings, or to have my readings, uh, readings of my poems in between with a poem of his. Um, in huge part because he played a major role in um, allowing me see the imperfections of poetry. Did you did you study with him in uh, New York? Is that? Oh uh, no, no, um, I, I didn't study with mm -hmm. him. I, I wouldn't think that he would laugh that far either. <laughs> um, since he didn't really enjoy teaching. Anyhow, that's for another day. Um, I'm going to read this poem from his last book, um, Almost Invisible, which I translate as Presque Invisible. Um, and I will read the French translation first, just so you can hear that, and I will read the original after that. L'assistant social et le singe. Un jour, j'étais assis dans une pièce avec un singe qui me raconta qu'il n'était pas un singe. Je compris son angoisse d'être coincé dans un corps qui détestait. Monsieur, lui dis-je, je pense savoir ce que vous ressentez et j'aimerais vous, vous aider. Traitez-moi comme un singe, et toquez-t-il. Ça m'apprendra. So here's the original version. The social worker and the monkey. Once, I sat in a room with a monkey who told me he was not a monkey. I understood his anguish when trapped in the body he detested. Sir, I said, I think I know what you're feeling, and I would like to help you. Treat me like a monkey, he said. It serves me right. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, um, Fiona Z. Laran. Um, a, a pleasure talking to you, and so much... Um, I, this is one of those episodes that um, I, I might want to listen to twice because um, there's so many great insights into what you had to say and uh, so many beautiful poems that... Um, you know, re you know, ask that we read them again and again. So um, thanks so much for sharing those, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. And um, thanks for sharing your, your evening with us tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. So that was Fiona Z. Laran with um, um, The Rain in Plural is her newest book, which I will show on screen for everybody right here. The rain in plural, or just rain in plural. And um, it's available here from press.princeton.edu. Um, just just arrived um, a few weeks ago. So check that out if you would. And we will move on to our open mic portion of the show. As always, we have a prompt. Um, and the prompt this week was, i got to find it. I have so many windows open for this episode right now. Let's see. So the prompt was, um, write a concrete poem, and that's a poem that takes a particular shape on the page. The content of the poem should have a connection to the shape. Um, so that was this week's prompt, write a concrete poem. If you wrote a concrete poem, um, you can 
uh, email it to us at openmic at rattle.com right now if you haven't yet that's openmic at rattle.com um, or uh, and then after you do that's what that way I can show it on screen and after I do you can um, send us a chat message over Skype to rattle poetry all one word or um, call us up 818-850-7727 let it ring a couple times and um, I will call you right back so um, 818-850-7727 I'm not going to answer but just wait for me to call you back. There is a delay um, of about 30 seconds, so it's a little confusing. Uh, make sure you turn off your um, video stream um, and, and only do Skype or uh, the phone if you call in to sh- talk about your poem. Um, and now my poem, um, I had a, I struggled with this prompt a little bit, I have to be honest, um, but, but there is a... Um, one time, I, I have a, a dream journal for a long time next to my bed, and so I wake up in the morning and um, write my dreams down, right? And um, I realize they're pretty boring dreams. Like, usually I'm just playing baseball, <laughs> but um, and, and that's why I kind of gave up, because the dreams weren't actually as interesting as I thought they might become. But um, so I had a notebook for a long time, and, and every once in a while, do you ever get the experience where you write a um, poem in your sleep, and you think that it's... Um, good and he's like oh if i only i could um write down that poem then i would have a good poem that i wrote in my dream well uh one time i woke up in the middle of the night and wrote down a um a poem or at least the idea for a poem and i thought it was brilliant and i woke up and looked at the note you know and um it just said poem in the shape of a duck and um so i thought well i have to write a poem in the shape of a duck but um it took me so much time to figure out how to make a poem in the shape of a duck that um, it's a very concrete poem. And here it is. This is my poem in the shape of a duck. And as you can see, it actually is in the shape of a duck. And I will read it to you now. Goose, 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 etc. So that is my poem in the shape of a duck. Um, I don't know. Good luck with that. I guess it's avant-garde, right? Now, here's Megan. She actually wrote a poem. I mean, that counts, right? A poem in the shape of a duck counts. Okay. Um, so this is Megan's poem, and this is Riverbend. You can fit it all on the screen for everybody. Riverbend. And this is, uh, for those watching at home, or just listening, I mean, this is a shape sort of like a winding river. In the end, it's all a fog. The water comes, and you bend to meet it. All is well and satisfied. You watch the news. You never cried. I love that last line. I'm not really sure what that means, but it means something. And I like it. So, um, so that was Megan's poem for today. Let's see what you came up with. Uh, we have, let's see, Angela, Vicky, Kathy. Um, Nivy asked if I would read it for her because it's like 2 a.m. in uh, India, and we will as long as we have time. And I think we will. Um, let's call up Angela Gartner and see how she's doing today. Uh, we'll find her poem as we go. <laughs> hey, Angela, how you doing today? Let me pull you in. Goose, 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 right? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Don't worry, I didn't say all the gooses. I just and and this the secret is that there's a one duck in there. Um, you have to find it. Oh. Though. <laughs> I don't know. I thought maybe there'd be some cleverness that I could add to it, and um, I don't think it actually works. But that's life. That's life. Sometimes um, sometimes you fail. And uh, that's what I did this week. But um, I mean, you the shape was beautiful, it was shaped. Though. Yeah, it took a long. You know, you have to um, use the pen tool in Photoshop and um, find a silhouette and then like hand draw it. It actually took a while to do that. Um, and I thought I would like somehow be inspired in the process to like actually write a poem, but I I was not. And then it was like I was tired, so I just pasted the word goose fifty times. <laughs> anyway, that was my that was my poem. So what did what did you come up with? Well, um, I know I, I tried to do the pen tool and um, I do it in InDesign, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, this time I actually shaped it and then I didn't like how I shaped it. So I actually did it in Word for once. So, like I actually like took that time to do it, but um, it's actually in shape of a dog. Ah, oh, okay. So, yeah, I see it. And um, it's actually, it's it's based off of my son's stuffed toy Mm -hmm. and he he's got a a, a one who's like really personal and is i'm not using that name but he also has another dog named chip and it kind of signifies that 
you know, it. I worry. I worry that, you know, someday he's not going to have that comfort because, you know, stuffed animals are such a big comfort. And especially, you know, in my family, it it's something that, you know, it's, it's that coping mechanism that will go away someday when, you know, he gets older. So that's, you know, I was kind of thinking about, you know, his stuffed, you know, stuffed dog mm -hmm. and, and, you know, how it's such a big part of our existence that, you know, someday we're not going to have that. And it's, you know, for him, you know, who, you know, has ADHD, it's really actually important for him, you know, to have some kind of coping and, um, and have that, that way to connect and, and kind of use that calming, you know, mm -hmm. cope, you know, so that's why I was thinking about it. And I, you know, and I, I just, uh, and so it's in the shape of his dog's head. So <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Whenever you're ready, I'll, I put it up for everybody. Okay. The dark disappears when you hold him in the night. The bear hugs are saved for days that aren't right. The joy in your face is in kisses you place on his nose. A snuggle in bed, just you and him in the cold knowing that he's waiting for you at home. The day will come when adolescence kicks in. With your comfort sitting on a shelf, I worry, the solid ice underneath your skates will melt. Oh, that's touching. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Oh, you're welcome. Have a, have a good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's unusual to see some light out the window. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um... Let's see if, um, let's call it Vicky Miko and see what she, since it's earlier in the day, usually she can't make it, but she can now. Vicky, are you there? Ah, here he comes. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it works oh, great. I, hi there. <laughs> Let me send this to Angela. You good? I think you might have froze for a second. I, oh, I'm so oh, okay. sorry. I didn't hear the uh, Angela's whole poem. I loved it. Well, you can always, I think I that's a good um, time to remind people that, that both on um, YouTube and Facebook, you can actually pause, like, it's like, what's that? You know, you can pause live things and go back. So you can, after you're done, you can go back and listen to the rest of Angela's. Okay. Um, but for everybody else too, if, oh, you have to, I sure will. if you have to go, um, you know, use the restroom or get a drink or something, um, you can always pause it and then come back. It actually works, which um, is pretty cool. Um, but then you have to catch up if you're going to be um, alive. Oh. But um, but anyway, oh, so okay. so Vicky, you have um, this is a really cool um, piece of art. Did you just make this for uh, for this, or is it something you already had? No, I I made it for this, and I had an extra week to work on it <laughs> well, because uh, uh, Rattlecast wasn't on last week, so. I, I kind of sat there and worked on it. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. Yeah. It, it was it. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that a, a fox or a cat? It's a fox. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, um, I, um, in my, in my email, uh, I took a photo of a fox running through the weeds, uh, when we were walking on the trail and it inspired it inspired the concrete oh, poem. That's a beautiful. So that's your that's you your photo. That's a see that. that's a really cool photo. Yeah, I see that too. Everybody else yeah. does. Yeah, that's that's a great photo. That could yeah. be a painting. I was I was amazed that I caught it. Yeah, like that yeah, that because, is wonderful. You know, it's really. And also, I I, I had to say that um, that interview with Fiona was exceptional. Um, both of you were just. Uh, I mean, I could listen to you guys all, all day. Uh, uh, I just think of uh, goosebumps and elegance. <laughs> yeah, well, she are she the two is words a, that come to she mind. She is a real artist's uh, soul. You could tell. I mean, like she is deep, a deep, deep thinker. Yeah. It was really interesting hearing her perspectives. Like, I mean, that's why I said I'm gonna have to listen to it again because, like, I caught, you know, a lot of the amazing lines she was just sort of saying off the top of her head. But um, oh, we lost Vicky for a second. But um. Let's recall, reconnect. Um, but yeah, a lot of great, a great stuff. Um, let's see if we can connect again. Uh, I'm back. Um, I, 
Okay, what? do I have uh, my audio? Is my audio working? Yeah, you're good. It, it just dropped, the call dropped for a second, but you're good to go. Um, do you want to do you want to go ahead and read your poem? Sure. Okay. I hope you're dropping again. Um, maybe I'll just read it for you since um, we're having connection issues. Yeah. But um, so I'll read it for you. But but we got to hear about it, which is the, the most important part and got to see you, too. So so thanks, Vicky, for for joining, um, even though the, the connection wasn't good. Um, here we go. This is a coming home with this was beautiful little piece of art with a fox coming home, coming home. I'll take you to Bailey Hill Farm tomorrow noon. The pink ladies are juicy tart and the beets are sweet and heavy there's a patch of creamy white oysters and morals ripe on the bog bank found a downed oak tunnel perfect for our long season rendezvous i've picked up enough goldenrod and dandelion wings they're deep inside my coat i'll be enough to sh it'll be enough to shake down and seed the far meadow before snow it'll fill the bare spots behind the broom's edge I may stop for a drink and a crayfish at Bassett Creek. I'll bring you a lively one, a good hunt, my love. This season has been ripe. Coming home, coming home. And there's that beautiful picture. Um, that should be like on a on a wall somewhere. I love that that photograph. That's really cool. And a really cool poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. It was Vicky Miko with her um, concrete poem. Um, she wins the day so far, I think. That was a great, great piece. Great combination of stuff. Um, let's see. Let's do um, Kathy Gibbons. Calling up Kathy. I think I saw her poem on here. Um, there it is, yeah. The dull, the deer, the pain, the bliss. Uh, hey, Kathy, how are you doing today? Hi, Tim. I'm doing great. What a wonderful show. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, always my pleasure. These are just so much fun. I, you know, I, I don't know what I used to do without having these... Um, these fun broadcasts to do every week. Don't uh, ever it's, stop. It's, yeah, yeah. It's really, it's really a. I don't know. It's, it's my pleasure is a, the truth of it. Um, so, so what was your concrete poem? I see a um, a square. Well, <laughs> yes, I I'm afraid I feel like I'm always cheating, but but um, I didn't know about any of these tools, which maybe I'll play around with them sometime in the future. But I decided to use a quadrangle because I think. It is true to the uh, referencing the shape in the poem, so I hope so. That's great. Well, let's hear it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, it's called The Dull, the Deer, the Pain, the Bliss. Behave like a mirror. See yourself in all. Shine back. Wink in sun. Be opaque in steamy times. Reveal but what is there. Or add an asterisk, all your own. Draw pictures or write messages in disappearing ink, slipping down in rivulets. You too will fade away one day, dropping off the map of unlined faces. Unspoiled Dorian Gray, you'll go the way you're meant to go, sliding, smearing, blurring out of range into unbeing, once have been, lipstick bled, Blotted kiss upon a tissue. What remains? Excellent. That was a great poem. Uh, thanks so much for sharing it, Kathy. Okay. Thank you, Tim, for having us. Yeah, <laughs> okay. our pleasure. Bye. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. Yeah, it was Kathy Gibbons with um the dull, the deer, the pain, the bliss. Um, let's do. I think we have uh, Danny Mask, and um, I'll I'll read Nivi Nivedita's poem uh, for her. Let's see what else we have. Um. Let's see. I'm trying to read some people's messages right now. I think there might be a few more people that are asking if I'll just read it for them. Uh, but I know Nivy wants me to. So um, this is her word. Let me see. Um, let's see. This is Nivedita Karthik. Um, it's the poem's in the shape of a teardrop, which is, which is also connected to the topic of the poem and the content of the poem. The poem is titled Cry. Uh, so, here we go. Cry. Cry. Words were inscribed into my heart I could never erase. Scars were created in my soul that could never be sealed. My very dreams 
became memories forgotten as they hid behind yours. My individuality lies trapped, trapped now in a cage made of your so-called love. The warmth of the cold white snow melts as it runs down my face, heated by the fire within. Surrounded by so many, yet supported by none, the cold wraps around my soul, encasing it in a cage so secure, like the one you put in me, remember? Tears and smiles no longer hold the power to hurt me anymore. And that is Nivedita's poem, Cry, in the shape of a teardrop. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nivy. Um, let's see. Let's call up Danny Mask, and then I'll see... I'm going to try to see... There, we have a bunch of people who sent... Um, concrete poems but aren't here let's see um because probably because of the time of the day um so I, I know um let's see so carla schwartz sent one was carla on the call list um no she's definitely not yet so if you're here carla give me a call and you can read it um yourself. But let's call up danny mask and then i'll see what else is on what else is on the list here Hey, Danny, how you doing today? Best day of my life. <laughs> awesome, it always is. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, what time is it? You're on the East Coast, right? Yep, it's four, almost 4.30. Yep. Um, do you like this time, or is this, uh, do you like the later n at night time better? I'm just curious what people think. I, you know, I, I'm retired, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a bad way to be. Um <laughs> Yeah, we're moving, but, um, you know, I mean, probably next week won't be good, but this is good. And oh, the time's yeah. good. Are you, is it a long, and moving to a new place, a new city, or the same area? No, moving to Wilmington, North Carolina. Ah, okay. And where are you now? Uh, Blacksburg, Virginia. Ah, okay, interesting. Um, yeah, my, my father's dream was always to live in North Carolina for some reason. I don't, I'm not really sure why, but I hear it's beautiful. I've never been, um, but I hope you enjoy it. The shrimp. It. He oh. probably likes the shrimp. The shrimp I guess are so. phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'd always say where my uh, my clothes fit my attitude or something like that. Uh, anyway, so Gertrude Stein's house is your is your um, poem. Is there anything you want to say about it, or do you want to just jump right in? Well, if if anybody tried to tackle uh, tender buttons, um, she did a lot of text manipulation, and um, so I I can't honestly say I read it all the way through, but it really inspired me to to write this poem and really is an inspirational piece i mean it really is because i like run on sentences and she really surely does a lot of that yeah she definitely does it's definitely and speaking of like um you know imagination expanding poems gertrude stein is definitely one of those yes yes and i i just really like what she does with language i really do i'm it's 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 really fractured and i, and I really enjoy that part you know make people think a little bit mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, well, go ahead and read it. I put it up for everybody. Okay. Here is the house you offer me. Nothing but an odd place with bold rivers of words and the gravitational pull of accumulated objects. Surrounded by manicured verbs, piled high, ornamentless. The unforgiven foundlings of constructed nouns. Images deprived of open, ostentatious rambles, perf perfume breath bird song, encircling covetous eyes with peripheral truth, and the fleeting wide prairies, flattened like cardboard cutouts, your plain, toothless face, a world you know. Excellent. Another great poem. Thanks so much. Danny Mast with Gertrude Stein. I've, I've, never, I've never seen her smile, you know, that's the oh, last yeah, part. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. For she sure. Smile. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much that's for sharing fun. that, Danny. Yeah, always a pleasure. You too, buddy. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Okay. Um, I think that might be everybody because I'm not sure. The other people who sent stuff um, didn't say that that I could read it, you know, for them if they weren't here. Um, let me see. One last check through the email, make sure. So Gail. Oh wait, that was from Sunday. Um, let me check my other. I'm gonna look up the word concrete. And make sure nobody sent something I'm missing. Um, ah, yeah, Carlton Johnson did. So I guess, okay, perfect. So um, I, I knew there was something I was forgetting. So here's Carl Johnson with tree, tree lines. And this is a, um, 
a tree you'll see in a second here we go tree lines by carl johnson it's funny grasp of arms tentacles reaching betwixt between the vast unseen underseen we atop our world find no thing abnormal or unknowable and yet layered in a fine web beneath the floral floor it tenderly touches tendrils making calm or spreading alarms or subterranean amber alert we the terrestrial dwellers too have nets cast from here to there angling for a nibble from others mycelia do because it is in their nature the wood wide web is twenty four seven conveying convincing other networked plants aided by the secretive fungi no Wi-Fi needed. And it was Tree Lines by Carlton Johnson. And I think maybe he's referring to, I saw an article, I was thinking about doing a psyche about, about how um, plants, um, trees communicate with each other through the roots in some kind of, you know, fun, fungus assistance. And I think that's what um, Carlton is referring to there. So I think it's sort of a poet respond poem too, um, but a cool concrete poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carlton. Um, let, me, let me do the same thing and just make sure, I don't want to miss anybody who asked me to read it. Because I'm not, you know, it's early in the day. I don't really have any, um, anywhere I have to go. We're going to the library later. I get some new um, series of unfortunate event books for the kids. Let's see. So Cameron Gray. Yeah, Cameron probably can't. Um, let's see. This is Snail Trails. And um, here we go. I'll do Cameron Gray. I think a lot of people... Um, who are normally here can't uh, can't make this time, I think. But um, but when when Cameron comes and watches this later, she'll be able to hear and see her poem. This is Snail Trails, her shape poem. Um, I think this is the last one we'll do. Um, here, Snail Trails. When the birds get too peckish and the mice scuttle by, I simply slip into my shell. When the moon crawls from slumber and the sun has its nap, I will push my eyes to the sky. When the rock grows too heavy, or my lung folds in two, I will know what it means to die. That's a great poem, Snail Trails, uh, by Cameron Gray. Thanks so much for sharing that, Cameron. And that will be all for today. Um, thanks to everybody who, who could join us at this unusual time. I appreciate it. Um, next week's prompt is going to be, um, let me find it first. Here we go. This is next week's prompt, and it is, Write a poem that focuses on opposites or contradictions. A noisy library, a sunny night, a tragic comedy, things like that. Write your whole poem about one contradiction or sprinkle many throughout. So that's the prompt. Write a poem that focuses on opposites or contradictions. Um, so there you go. That's Megan's prompt for next week. Um, write your poem. You have a week. Uh, ready, set, go. And uh, call in for the open mic next Tuesday. And uh, next Tuesday's guest will be... Uh, Brian Sonia Wallace. Um, he has a new book, The Poetry of Strangers: What I Learned Traveling America with a Typewriter. And and if you if you're a longtime listener of the Rattlecast, the very first episode, episode number one, was with Benjamin Elshire, who um, um, writes uh, poems for strangers, sort of on street corners and in and, um, and at farmers markets and, and in Paris and all over the place, um, travels the world. And Brian Sony Wallace does the same thing. Um, he takes his typewriter and um, Rent Poet, I think rentpoet.com is his website, uh, but he goes all over the world writing poems um, by um, four strangers based on the things that they ask about. And, um, and so he wrote a novel, or a, I guess it's not a novel, it's a, um, a nonfiction book. Um, based on his travels across America, writing the poetry of strangers. It's a really unique look into the mind of people and what people are interested in thinking about and, um, and the poems they come up with. So it's going to be really interesting talking to Brian Sony Wallace, um, his new book, The Poetry of Strangers, that is next Tuesday, November 17th, the regular time, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. That's Rattlecast number 67, and I hope to see you there. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Good night. <laughs>